थे वासुदेवाया हरि बोल सो आम कंटिन्यूइंग विथ द माय असाइन टॉपिक रीकनेक्टिंग विथ आवर सोर्स आम इट्स एक्चुअली रियली मेजरली प्रोफाउंड थिंग टू कंसीडर and there's so many things attached to it the foundation for everything that we're going to talk about is the understanding that this body that i have on is not me i'm not male or female i'm not a kiwi or american or chinese or an indian or no Now, I'm an eternal spiritual being occupying this body temporarily. I'm not going to be here for long. I'm going to have to move on. And because I am an eternal spiritual being, I do have a nature. I do have characteristics. I do have desires that are all inherently spiritual, profoundly spiritual. but when i live in this illusion that the body is me then i seek to fulfill deep spiritual needs just on the level of my body and mind and when i do that i do not experience fulfillment and things tend not to go very well one of the things that we discussed last week was how unnatural isolation is for us that when people are in a state of isolation it's either they've been forced to do it and and like in a prison solitary confinement or some extreme form of being ostracized from a society or i am in such a state of profound sadness that i completely withdraw from the world and if that becomes too grave it goes from being in a state of depression to contemplating um suicide so isolation in any of its forms is not is not natural for us when we look at it from a spiritual perspective so looking um one of the verses that i quoted last week was a verse from the one of the upanishads the um brihad aranyaka upanishad and it states that as tiny sparks fly from a fire so the individual souls have come from the supreme if we are talking about reconnecting with our source reconnecting with what it is that we are actually yearning for then it is essential to have some sort of understanding of of who i am and where have i come from in that regard and so this is an examination of the idea okay sparks in the fire i can sort of get that you know a huge bonfire with just limitless sparks flying flying out from it this example though that is given to try and help us understand has something really important about it if you examine a spark that has come from the fire it has the qualities of fire it emits light it emits some heat it has the qualities of fire but there is a significant difference between the spark and the fire it is a, what's called a quantitative difference a difference in size if you wish So when we talk about the living being you the spiritual being having emanated from something or something it seems to you know it it 
this question arises, so what, are we, what, are, what exactly are we talking about here? Are we talking about the soul em emanating from God? And of course, my response to such a question, if anybody did ask me, is, well, what do you mean by God? And unfortunately, much of what Before I get started on this, I, I just am so hesitant um, because I don't want to, and I want you to understand, I'm not being critical of anyone. My intention is not to, not to be critical of anyone. My intention here is to try and encourage people to look further, to look um, deeper. Often, what's promoted in this world when people speak of God is actually a caricature of God. And because it has this aspect of being almost like a caricature, you know, there are n numbers of people that sort of get turned off by that and, and turn away from it. And I'll just give you an example, like the Sistine Chapel here you are meant to have one of the centers of great religiosity and meant to be spirituality. And they engage someone to paint on the, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, this amazing, amazing painting. But they've got a picture of this old guy who's like really muscular. And he kind of looks okay, he's, he looks cool. And he's got really long, gray beard and a long gray hair, you know, and this was, was, Ad, uh, was God um, giving life to Adam. Um, there's many things I can say about that, but that's what I'm referring to when I say that often people's concept of God is somewhat of, of a caricature you know, of a, of a, a judge, uh, somebody that gets horribly upset and angry, totally pissed off if you do the wrong things and you're going to get punished and, and stuff. This is not really a very mature or developed appreciation of the highest truth. So, you know, it, it kind of extends out to this idea then where people speak about a Christian God, a Muslim God, a Hindu God, you know, and it's just like, oh, how sad. How sad that people think in these extremely limited terms. It doesn't really help them in, in understanding. So for people that are tend towards being atheistic, I, I would like to beg from you the consideration that perhaps what you don't like is the caricature of God, as opposed to the idea of some truly amazing, transcendent spiritual reality. So, um, when we then look at this question of, of, you know, the spark and the fire, taking it a little bit further, we're going to go into this little bit of a discussion of the nature of personality. In the, in the Vedas, and we see it, you know, really in a major way in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, where he uses this terminology, Purusha. Purusha refers to a person. Doesn't refer simply to an impersonal energy. energy. Refers to a person. This is Purusha. And in the, in the Upanishads and the Puranas, this term is frequently used 
But in one of the great Upanishads, or two of them, sorry, Mundaka and Svetasvatara Upanishad, there is, they both use this, this um, verse, Nityo Nityanam Chetana Chetana that amongst all eternals, meaning amongst all living beings, uh, all spiritual beings, there is one that is different than the rest. Amongst all conscious beings, Chetana and Chetananam, which is plural, there is one that sort of stands out and, and is different and is recognized that amongst the many living entities, he is the chief who fulfills the desires of the others. So this is spoken about also in, in the Yoga Sutra, when Patanjali speaks first of the living being, the Atma, as being the Purusha. And then he's speaking about how the living being can regain its lost spiritual awareness of your real spiritual identity, your spiritual being. And he's describing the processes of meditation and, and control of the mind, which are absolutely required to become free from this clutter that is produced by the mind in a state of material consciousness. After explaining these processes, he now throws out this one verse, Ishwara Pranidhanava, and he speaks about when one can go through an alternative process of deep surrender and submission to Ishwara. So it's kind of like, okay, where did this come from? And what does he mean by Ishwara? And then he goes into a series of verses where he explains that Ishwara is a special Purusha. Unlike all others, he is a special Purusha. He is untouched by material suffering, karma, material activity, and the fruits of karma, nor is he involved in what's called latent impressions. We're not going to get into that. That's kind of like um, a technical aspect of yoga. Then he continues, in him the seed of omniscience is unsurpassed, meaning infinite. He is also the teacher of all ancient teachers or the great rishis, being not limited by time. And the transcendental sound representing him is this Om, the Pranav Omkara. That sound should be recited repeatedly and meditated upon, contemplating its meaning. So now he's described that now all of a sudden we're learning that there's two, two categories of being. One of them are like myself, and there is this unique one that is around. In the Bhagavad Gita, the same theme is reinforced, where it states that yet in this body, meaning our own body, after having described the living being who resides there, yet in this body there is another, a transcendental enjoyer, who is the Lord, the supreme proprietor, and who exists as the overseer and permitter, and who is known as the supreme soul. This reference is presented much earlier, even in the Bhagavad Gita, in the, in the Upanishads, um, in the, especially in the Mundaka Upanishad. It describes how within each body there are actually two beings. And they use an analogy of like two birds sitting in the same tree. The supreme soul and the living entity are compared to two birds sitting in a tree. 
and while the illusioned living entity eats the fruits of the material world, trying to enjoy the fruits in the tree, the supreme soul and best friend of that bird witnesses these activities. And although the two birds are in the same tree, the eating bird, the jiva, is fully engrossed with anxiety and moroseness, trying to be the enjoyer of the fruits of this tree. However, in some way or other, if he turns to his friend, the Lord, and knows his glories, then the suffering bird becomes immediately freed from all anxieties. So what is being spoken to here is about the topic that we're speaking of, the re our reconnecting with, with our source. When we speak about the Supreme Soul, we're not speaking about something all cosmic and and impersonal or, or, you know, some cosmic concept, if I can use that terminology. We're not speaking, you know, of a limited concept of some great and transcendent being who is our eternal friend. We're not even speaking about someone that is actually foreign to us. The reality is, is that unbeknown to us, we have an existing relationship with this transcendent personality who is also sitting within our heart. We have free will, and having free will, we can choose to do whatever we want. But all of our choices have consequences. If you are fundamentally unhappy in your life, it is because you're making bad choices. You're engaged in activity that's not producing the result you desire. Like when we use this term soulmate, it actually irritates me that people use it to refer to another person of this world. It irritates me not because, you know, I, I'm upset at somebody doing that, but because we become deprived of the opportunity to find what is in our best interest, what is what is actually in our in our greatest. What is our greatest benefit? And that is to reconnect with this Supreme Soul. Since time immemorial, even though you may hear many different things espoused today that are fundamentally not authentic, they're inventions. Since time immemorial, the great yogis went off to the forests and engaged in the deepest of meditations upon this spiritual, this transcendental personality who resides along with them within their own heart, that person that we have turned our face away from for so long. And the yogis sought to reconnect reconnect with their source, to reconnect with the actual Lord of their heart. When we speak of this transcendent personality, we are speaking about our dearest, sweetest, and most profoundly wonderful, eternal friend, the Lord of our own heart who is himself known as the reservoir of all pleasure. And if, if 
you can reconnect. You will experience the most overwhelming form of happiness. It doesn't mean you don't have relationships in this world. You know, we're here and we will have relationships and we do have relationships. But when we have somebody that we care about and that person and myself both have the same focus, when my focus is to try and assist my partner in life to reconnect with the Lord of her heart and she is trying to encourage and assist me in my reconnecting, then we are capable of the deepest and sweetest form of relationship. It's not focused on ourselves. That can never go very well. Anybody having a wonderful time in that dimension? They've found the perfect relationship. Anybody who puts a hand up and says, yes, I have. Okay, let's talk in five years. <laughs> See how you're doing. Or ten years. I mean, people live their whole life together. Then they get divorced in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's just like, we cannot, we cannot provide each other with what it is that we are seeking. The most profound form of spiritual love, the greatest of all spiritual experiences and happiness. And so we'll be exploring this a little bit further in a bit more detail over the next um, couple of, of meetings here. Our not being connected with our actual source is the underlying reason that we experience unhappiness. That is completely true. It's not about a belief system. Nobody's asked to believe anything. The yogis were far out. I mean, they were, they were so profound in the way that they would take things apart and examine them. This is called Vivek, this discriminative learning. They were so focused in their intent, in their exploration, this inward journey. And all of them that experience self-realization and God-realization will share a common experience. So it's not like somebody's just dreaming it up. It is a common reality, a common spiritual reality. Okay, that's it. Was that too serious? Huh? What's that? There is a soul. The soulmate is not out there. The soulmate yeah. is in there. It's not you, by the way. It's it's another transcendent. There's this whole other philosophy that's you know developed. It it just blows my mind how all this new agey and wonky ideas that people are just un unaware of where they've come from. Many of them have come and come from a distortion of very ancient yogic teaching. And, and have filtered into the West. And then when all the hippies got tired of taking drugs in the 60s and decided to go back to university, most of them studied the arts. They became psychologists or psychiatrists or sociologists. You know, they frequently weren't very interested in, in the hard science. They, were, they liked that kind of stuff. And they brought into it you know, all of this, these ideas, and I know the genesis of them, and so it frustrates me, and it just gets passed around. And because somebody, some professor or somebody that wrote a book said something, and everybody goes, oh, that's wonderful, I love that. 
<laughs> yeah, but if it doesn't bring you to the highest possible spiritual experience, then I'm, then it's of very limited or no value. Okay, we good? Yeah, sure. Where does the soul sit? Is it in the heart or in the mind? Because we say the heart is broken. We never say mind is broken. Yeah. So like, you know. So we do say the mind is broken. <laughs> the, the yogis speak about, and this is the product of, of both experiment, of personal seeing, but also through what's called agama, the, the authoritative teaching. When we say authoritative, we're talking about, you know, well, people that really know what's going on. So they talk about there are five principal forms of air circulating in the body and five minor types. There are ten principal types of air and they serve different functions. The living being, the spiritual being, is situated within these subtle airs, these pranas, and is located in the region of the heart. It's not like inside the <laughs> yeah, it's within, it's a lot more subtle than that. It's not a physical location, if I can say, but within the region of the heart. And by its, its influence, it, its consciousness travels through the extent of the body. Whether you're in the body of a bacteria or a body of a blue whale, that same, same living being manifests consciousness throughout the entire body because of the, the effect of this prana, consciousness is carried. Okay? Thank you very much.